Um, I'm just going to start off by introducing uh, Pascal Sebastian over here. Hi guys. So this is Pascal. He's our lead marine biologist for Indo-Ocean Project. Uh, he is also the um, founder, developer, coral expert extraordinaire no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who launched our Coral Alliance initiative um, during this COVID-19 time. So he's going to be talking to you guys about the Coral Alliance initiative, um, a little bit about corals as well. Uh, we're sitting here in Nusa Penida at one of our um, contributing members at Mambo Dive Resort here in Nusa Penida. So uh, if the internet goes a little wonky, please shoot us a message, let us know. If at any time you have any questions as we go, please feel free to type in um, any questions. I'll be monitoring that so we can uh, use this as well as a discussion. Yep. Um, and yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, actually guys, this is like the first time for me using Zoom. I'm that lame, so um, forgive everything if I make mistake. Um, yeah, so I'm I here to coach you for that. yeah. <laughs> so take it away. So and then also if you have any questions or whatever, um, just shoot at the chat and then we're gonna discuss that because I think it's better um, to have discussion rather than I'm talking and talking. Right. So shall we just start? Go for it. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so um, this Indo Coral Alliance initiative, um, we're going to go through introduction and then I'm going to also let you know what we do here and then also the update, uh, what's the challenge here um, and then how is it going with the guys and also um, how is the effect um, so far with the community. So it's very exciting. Um, right. Okay, so I couldn't see that. <laughs> Let me put this one down. Yeah. Just, yeah, all right. So Coral Alliance is from Coral Alliance. So this is like, a, I would say a sub project because like I still here, we need Indo Ocean Project to um, make a good publications for it. Um, so probably firstly, I would gonna talk about our conditions in Nusa Penida. It's an island in um, in Bali, the small island in south, east, uh, southeast, and then uh, it's really affected by the virus right now, the pandemic. So everything is closed. Um, there is no tourism anymore. Um, so in the middle of my boredom, like I have to think about um, what should we do because like we just stay at home. Um, basically, we are. I would say we are free from the virus, um, like there is no case. I don't know if there is any tests, but we are from, we have zero case. So we are basically like free to go everywhere. We still use the mask. Um, uh, there was no boat, like no single boat, just a public ferry just once a day, um, just to transport the material and also the food. Um, so it was in um, early of April. So there's um, nothing that we can do, everything's closed. And then all my friends just like screaming, oh my God, what should we do? I'm running out of money. And then, so that's why I'm, I was thinking about to make a project, make something to create a job, but also um, impactful for the environment. And also I can use my skill to help people. Um, so there you go. This in the Coral Alliance, I discussed with Lauren, like uh, we should do this and she supported me very well. Um, superly and then so this is like an initiative um, environmental and social initiative based on the island of Nusa Penida and it's from the response of the uh, lockdown policy because there is no tourism in here so the one that really survived in here is just a local warung so warung is like a small um, shop to eat that's the only existing business right now I mean um, for now we start to open again but um, in early of April, that's the only thing like um, like a traditional market and also a small shop to to go for it. Um, other than that, there's nothing. Hotels close, um, water sports close, um, transfer boats close. So business like really collapse, and then so that's why like many people lost their job in night, especially for tourism industry workers. And this um, project we aim we have three aims in here. So I feel like um, this is like really impactful. 
and also we got a lot of support for, for these three aims. So first, I want to do something. We want to do something to give it back to the environment. So to restore the coral reef, and then also with my skill, I also can share, I can educate more people, my friend in here, because like usually when we, when we work, um, I always uh, work with my interns, with my students, but I rarely share my knowledge to like the people, the local people here. So this, I think this is like a best, a very good chance for me to, um, to share my knowledge. And also because like we don't have any income anymore. So why don't we create a job? So there you go. Um, yeah. Right, so let me introduce you to the team member right now. Um, so I'm, of course me, <laughs> the marine biologist. So I lead uh, these people. Um, so Arya. So Arya is, um, is a dive guide here. Of course, um, there is no, no one diving right now. Um, in the, in the past few months, so he lost his job and then is willing to do um, to join the project and then so he's really uh, excited about this project and then um, probably the most passionate person to learn about new things and also about corals. Um, and then if you ever visited Nusa Penida, you must know this guy, this guy's name Tony and then you go to Full Moon, he will serenade, he will serenade you with the very beautiful uh, voice. Um, he's a musician, um, so he doesn't really dive um, previously. So really happy with this because we have also a different background of people um, in a team. And also um, we have Sammy. Sammy is the dive guide. Uh, he used to be a freelance dive guide like around the dive shop. So basically if some, somebody needs a, a guide, additional guide. Um, he will hire it, him in daily basis. Also, we have Barik here. Um, he's from Nusa Penida. Oh, yeah, so Arya is from Nusa Penida. Tony is from Flores. Sam is from Jaffa, from West Jaffa. And we have Barik. Uh, Barik is from uh, Nusa Penida. So he's a local boy here and he's also a musician. Um, and, on, yeah. and then we have Kadek. He's also a dive guide training uh, right now with Purple Dive. Um, but for now, he also do like a construction job in Purple Dive. So this is a very um, good chance for him to um, add some money in um, to, uh, for this project. And also he's really passionate to learn about corals. Uh, we have a good day. Um, this is really interesting to him because he is a seawalker guide. And as we know, seawalker, um, it's a little bit contrary to conserve the corals. So I'm really happy to have him and a team, board as a team, um, so I can educate him as well, like what's the importance to protect the coral reef. Uh, we have Julie. Julie is a dive instructor. Um, he used to work in uh, Nusa Lembongan, the neighbor's island from Nusa Penida. Um, of course, for now he lost the job, and then he joins the team. He's the new um, the newest member for our group. Hang on a second, guys. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this um, these people they uh, they're responsible for a certain area. So I will explain you um, our nursery areas. Um, right. Let's continue. Yeah. So. This is the locations of our island. So obviously, you know, it's Bali. As the zoom out will be Indonesia. So it's in the east, uh, southeast of Bali here. Yep. And then zoom in. So this is like a little bit of our location, uh, the northern coast. And then we have smaller neighboring island, Nusa Lembongan and Nusa Ceningan. So this is um, the biggest island here, um, our lovely island, Nusa Penida. And this is our nursery spot. So um, if you ever come to Panida, this is the place that the first time you um, step your, your feet here, this is the harbor. And then also this is the other harbor for the ferry. So we are in the Northern coast here, uh, which is the, the most famous uh, spot to dive is Esti Point, which is around here. 
you got the best restaurant, uh, Panita Colada around here, and then several of the dive shops around here. Okay. Now, oh, it's empty. Okay, so basically in here, I wanted to say, uh, now why we have to um, restore the corals, why we have to um, protect the coral reefs. So we have to go from this, I think, um, our interest not knew about this already. This is my from my previous slides, but just to highlight the importance of the coral reefs, uh, why we need to protect them. So coral reefs is the foundations of the species because you know um, when you have the coral reefs, you have also uh, you create a home for a lot of um, animals like smaller fish and invertebrates as well, and it defines the ecosystem. Um, also, it's the base of the food chain, so you have the corals here, and then you have the, um, it will be eaten by corallifores. Corallifores is um, the creature uh, that its corals can be here, so I can go jump to the provide the uh, food for the corallifores, so from the mucus, gametes, or the eggs, and also from the tissue, also small smaller portion of the coral carbonates, and also the large portions like the excavators here, uh, if you know about the bumhead parrotfish, they like to, um, they contribute to produce like the cells from eating the corals. And then you have the bigger fish, um, which eats corally force. You have the bigger one, mesopredators and top predators here. Eventually it's the sharks um, also, and also human. And also it provides, <clears throat> it provides obviously the, the habitat for, and the nursery grounds for uh, many other species. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so if you dive, if you snorkel, and then you observe, um, like the smaller fish, like around here, um, they will hide uh, when you come towards the reef, to, towards the coral reef, because they use that to protect themselves. And also, if there is any strong current, usually like the fish will hide in between the crevices. Um, so this is like a house for them. Uh, that's why like we want to keep the coral reef, uh, we want to protect the coral reefs because we want to protect the house um, and also the nursing grounds, the place uh, where the fish grow and the other species as well, uh, like invertebrates. Um, and also um, stabilize the fundamental ecosystem process, productivity and nutrient cycles. So um, I'm not gonna go into deep to this because, um, but the broad one will be um, it also absorbs uh, the CO2, the carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere. So it helps to uh, prevent the global, um, to reduce the global warming. Okay, continue. Right, and then what's the benefit for a human? Um, so this is the typical um, reef structures that we have like around the world. So we have the slope over here, we have open water, and then we have the slope, and then we have the reef crest here. And then this is usually where the robust uh, coral reef will grow um, with a very complex structures. And then we have the reef flat, and we have the shoreline here. And then we have the coastal um, populations, community over here, like houses and um, like buildings here. So by the existence of the coral reef over here, uh, it reduces 97% of the energy from the wave. So the wave will break around here and then towards the reef flat, um, it will remain 3% of it. And then so it will prevent, of course, uh, the abrasions. So if we don't have the reef press over here or the coral reef over here, you can imagine um, like the waves, the energy will go through the reef flat and the shoreline and the abrasions rate will go higher. That's why it's really nice to have the reef crest over here. Um, it's a natural barrier um, to reduce the energy of the wave. And then also for us, um, of course, the tourism. Um, so obviously you can go dive and you enjoy the, um, the view. You enjoy also the uh, reef creatures, uh, the fish and the invertebrates. So it's um, of course the income for the community. And also, um, not to mention about the hotel, about, account, about the accommodations to the local people, of course, the fisheries, and also there is a potential for uh, research in medicine. 
um, for example, like um, I heard about the research that a uh, chemical compound from sponges can be can uh, have a potential to cure cancer, and also like a um, like a supplement um, for the calcium from the corals that that we also can use. Okay. I'm just gonna do a quick check yep. for everyone. Uh, when we move the mouse on our screen, can you see it on yours? Just type in an answer just to make sure. Yeah, no. yes, 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 okay, yes, we perfect. can. Okay, perfect, great, cool. thank you. <laughs> All right, we continue. So this is corals, but um, so doesn't matter the species, but I just want to mention to you that corals is not planned. This is probably the common mistake for people that People always say corals are plants, but it's incorrect. Corals are animals. Um, so where is the animal? So one of these is one animal that we call, we call polyp. And then we also have this kind of coral, which is, this is the whole polyp. So it's a solitaire and we have the colonial animals over here. Okay. We got some people joining, so yeah. Yeah, so we have this um, a little animals and that's why um, it's, when they grow, they spread and then they create the, uh, like a structures that we can see as a whole, um, like in a big structure. But this one is like a this usually, or like a sandal. We, uh, we will go through this like after a um, few slides. And we, um, they, yeah. So a little bit of the anatomy. So I don't want to uh, make That's you confused about this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> this is in Basa from my slides. So basically, this is the animal, and we will say that coral is a, a low-level animals because this is a fun fact as well. If you want to make a joke, because when corals eat plankton, um, they're gonna use the tentacle, which is uh, there is a, a toxin over here that can sting the uh, the plankton, and then when they eat it. We ate it through mouth, and then this is the digestion area. So the stomach is here, and then they will digest the uh, the food here, and then they will throw the food here. So they poop from so, so they eat through mouth, and then also poop from mouth. That's why it's a very low level animal. So it's a very simple animal, but of course, um, if you see like as a whole, it's not a very simple animal because they can create like a very wonderful structure. Um, yeah. So, and then, so this is the mouth over here, and then you have the tentacles, and this is like the hard structures over here. So every, um, so this is a single animal that you can see, and then they are connected with this um, calcium carbonate structures over here. So in this picture, we see, um, we are seeing the colonial animals, the colonial squirrel, not the solitary one. Now, oh, so probably back again to here um, because this is a solitary um, a coral. So all of this is not one single animal, but one of these are, uh, is um, the tentacle. So one of this is one animal and all of these are tentacles from them. While this one, this is like one animal and then you can see probably just a little bit of a smaller tentacles. Right. Any questions so far? Otherwise we continue. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit mixed with Indonesian. So um, instead of going to uh, the name of the species, um, I'm just gonna show you like um, diversity of the structures of coral reefs. So we have like a plate or table. So basically, obviously you can see here like the structure looks like a table and then you have the branching. This is the common one when, when you see you go snorkeling, probably this is the first thing that you will see, the branching one. And then you have massive or boulder. If you see like a very big rock, pinnacles or like a brain corals like this, we can just call it a massive or boulder. And then you have encrusting, uh, which is just uh, fall encrusted towards the rock and then just follow the structure. And then you have the folios or leafy. Um, so it's like a rose, like a cabbage. It looks like a flower. So something like this. And then you have digitate. Um, 
say it looks like your finger. And then this is the one, the solitaire one, which is like, uh, we call it Master of Corals, look like this. So it, uh, this shape, um, which is one single animal, and this is like a, like a sandal coral, we call it sandal coral because it looks like a sandal, a flip-flop. But all of this is one animal. And uh, we also have the soft coral. So the things that, uh, that I mentioned before are hard, and we also have the soft, which this one, they don't have the exoskeletons, but they have a tiny speckles to make sure they can erect here. And then, um, but when they die, they don't have, they don't leave the skeleton. They don't leave the skeletons. Well, this one, we, uh, we can see like the dead skeletons and we use, uh, usually wash out to, towards the beach. Right, now the polyp. So the polyp, um, we have diversity as well, like the differences between polyps in the different species from one millimeters to 25 centimeters. Um, so you can see here is sporitis, um, the name of the species. And then you can see like one of this hole is one, uh, one animal. Uh, compared to this is one animal. So this is like bigger, probably one or two centimeters. And then why it can, it can um, go through 25 centimeters. If we go back to here again, uh, yeah, this, if you measure it, it's probably like more than 25, something like that. So uh, remember one of this is also one animal. Yeah, so um, a lot of variety of the, the polyp size as well, and also the different name of the species and the genus. And uh, we're gonna go to the reproductions to, uh, so they, they have a sexual reproduction. I'm gonna show you the video. Two nights in the year after a full moon, a truly incredible event occurs, crucial to the future of the reef itself. The corals reproduce in their billions. As they spawn, a giant slick appears on the ocean surface. A spectacular mass gathering, visible from space. The annual spawning ensures the future survival of the coral. Okay, so in the natural conditions, in a, in a sexual way, um, this is how coral um, reproduce. So they do the coral spawning. And remember, because they are a low level animal, so they don't have, basically they don't have the complex, complex um, organs. So that's why like they need something, they need a cue um, from the nature to know like where is exactly um, the time to spawn. And then in order to, um, to get more successful rate of the reproductions, so that's why they use the full moon as the cue. Um, and it has to be together because when um, only like certain species they spawn and then like the other species they don't spawn um, so that you you can't really meet um, within the water does it make sense so um, when it's together and then there will be like more chance to um, to meet like the uh, sperm and the eggs um, so it's like you you guys like stay at home and then you want meet like girls or boys and then, but if you go to party or you go to um, something like that, there will be like more chance to find your mate, something like that, it's, it's quite similar. So that's uh, why they do the coral spawning and it's usually an annual event. Um, some of, in some of the place, places will be like twice a year, but it's usually like once a year uh, during the full moon. And if you want to see like this um, spawning event, it's usually uh, you will go uh, like five days or five, five days before or five days after full moon. Okay, now we go to, so that's the sexual way and then there is also a sexual. So a sexual in here, um, we have autotomy. So basically they just do the fragmentations. So this is like the whole master coral and then when they uh, break, 
uh, the corals and then they will create like a new individual. So this is usually occur in the master corals. And then also they can do fragmentations here. So um, when you see like a coral breakings um, in, around the reef crest or the reef flat and then it's still colored, then you'll see this is like still alive and then they will, they, they will grow again. But this is really susceptible um, to the waves and then also the silts um, and the sediments. So that's why uh, this is like the key points of our restorations project, this fragmentations uh, of sexual reproduction. And also the other thing about um, our project is uh, the ability of corals to do a fusion. So when, when they are the same species um, and then they come together um, in a short distance, if they have the same genes and all, they basically they are the same species, they can do the fusions like this. So this is like from two different colonies and then in a short, very short distance and then they gather together to make a better, um, like more compact structures like this. So this is all the young fusions of coral, uh, two coral fragments from here and here. And so uh, back again, this is gonna be our um, main point of our propagation um, strategy. So the, the ability of the corals to do sexual reproductions by fragmentation, and then also the fusions of the, uh, the ability for corals to do fusions if they are in the same species. All right, so we're gonna go to the restoration. So what is restoration? So I dug into Cambridge online and I found Restoration is the act of process of returning something to its earlier good conditions or positions or its owner. It's really beautiful, like the owner should be the matter of nature. Um, so uh, there are damages everywhere and then we would like to return it. We want to help, we always want to help to return it to, to er the earlier conditions, the good early conditions. Um, so that's why we want to do the restoration. Um, in this case, is the coral, <clears throat> the coral restorations. But also, I will also show you the misperceptions of um, the coral restoration. So sometimes when people call, um, people say about, okay, we're gonna restore the corals, it equals coral propagation. It's not the same. So um, this is only one effort of uh, coral. Uh, coral restoration is a coral propagation. So there will be many options to do a coral restorations and then coral propagation is one way to help to restore the coral reef ecosystem. And if you like, if people ask like, what's the best way to do it? And then I will say for, for my opinion is, um, I will quote from, for, from Barry Commoner from the Closing Circle 1971. Uh, he said, like, na na nature knows best. So we just leave it to the mother, mother nature. So basically, if we take out human from this world and then they just, like, return to um, to the good conditions. So that's, that's also restoration. But um, sadly, we are here. So that's why we have to... Um, uh, <laughs> it's sad, right? I mean, sadly, I mean, we're here for yeah. the coral. <laughs> sad for the corals because, like, we are here, and then so that's why we have to find a balance. Then how? Uh, that's how we do it. So we would like to lessen the stress of the coral environment, and uh, the sustainable way that really popular right now, and then um, also a lot of research in here is the marine protected area. This is to find a sustainable way. So basically, I'm. I'm really believe in uh, the sustainable way. So basically you conserve the coral reef and also you take the resource, like um, basically say like people can still eat fish and but also we can still enjoy fish to, uh, when we dive, something like that. Um, then it's a, a marine protected area, but how, uh, however, coral propagation is an excellent, excellent way to help the coral to thrive. Uh, when there is a history of coral ecosystem in given area. So uh, when people try to um, say like, okay, let's make a coral garden by doing coral propagation in here, like somewhere. And, but there was no history, there is no history of uh, the coral reef before uh, in that area. 
uh, it's quite impossible to do that because um, the environment, like the water conditions and the environment doesn't really support for the coral to grow. So that's why this is basically, it's a correct approach uh, to the, the coral restorations is to do the coral propagation when there is a, the, there is a history of living coral reef before and it's damaged and we would like to return it into the normal condition. We would like to help. But again, I would say Mother Nature knows better. Okay, so uh, we're gonna use uh, the Ocean Quest uh, methodology. Uh, the fundamental, um, the fun, uh, sorry, can't see. Okay, so it's an environmental friendly propagation technique. We would like to minimize uh, the utilizations of man-made structures. So we don't use like, uh, like a concrete or line we just use like what's available in the nature. <clears throat> and then so using what's available in the nature and also uh, the principle of maintaining it. So we're gonna use that one. And the main goal is to stabilize the coral substrate because when you see again, uh, we go back to this fragmentation thing. Um, so something like this. This is usually damaged because of the waves or probably if it's in a tourism area, you also can see like snorkelers kicking the corals or even divers. They also kick the corals like this um, or just a natural disaster like storms or uh, big waves, something like this. But this is really susceptible to sedimentations and also when the waves, um, when the water movement creates like frictions, so that's why uh, we don't have a, a good survival rate for this and to grow. So that's why we would like to have this um, fragments to have a stable or substrate, substrates, which is here. So we, we attach it to the rock and then there will be like a calcification happens around here. <clears throat> that's what we want. Right. And the conditions in Nusa Penida, like uh, mostly in the northern coast, um, some of the area is a coral rubble like this. And then this is a very, very difficult uh, substrate for coral to grow because it's unstable. So you can see like it's just a few corals here <clears throat> growing because there is in here, because there is a life rock over here. So it's a stable substrate. But when the baby corals like the uh, the larvae from the coral um, from the coral spawning they attach here um, it's really hard for them to to grow because like in here it's susceptible to the waves and to the movement as well so that's why we would like to stabilize that um, the substrate and this is how we do <clears throat> so uh, we did a training with these guys. Um, so this um, this is like the first training with the first batch of the group, and then the next one is here. Uh, so we f we found some of the replacement for the new guys. Um, so we we did a lot of discussions, and as you know, like these guys, they don't have any scientific background. So it was uh, quite challenging for me to um, how to say like you you have to even I speak as the same language but you have to translate it again into their language. So you can't really say, um, for example, how do you really explain pH to them? So you need to find like a way to explain that to them. So you have to translate again. So that's quite a challenge, but um, obviously they, um, they're really passionate to learn. So um, we can overcome the challenges as well. So no problem. So which were the workshops that you did with them? So we did, so we actually, we did two workshops already. First, it's uh, the same exact. So that's why like you have Indonesian slides because I just copy paste it. So it's the taxonomy um, about the corals, uh, the diversity of structures, and then what is, uh, what is corals, and then also the principle of the restoration, um, how we do it, like the technique of the propagation itself, and also in here, it's um, how uh, they do the water quality tests and also how to get the data. So basically, I introduced them to like a conservation job. Right. 
uh, we go to the equipment. Um, so here, got thermometer, bone cutter. So this is, uh, uh, so this one chisel and bone cutter is basically to cut the coral, to extract uh, the coral baby or coral nubbins. And then cyanoacrylate glue. So this is the agent to, to glue the coral. And then this one is Ocean Quest Global Catalyst. It's patent, so I really don't know the ingredients, but basically if you combine this cyanoacrylate glue and this one, it will bond the corals really, uh, really strong. And then you have the gloves, but the gloves also can be like the one that you can use again, so reusable. Uh, this is the latex one. So it's really, um, it's really strict that if we want to handle like the live animals, especially for the corals, because, because they also can um, secrete the uh, chemical reactions toward us. So it's really strict that we use the protections in here. In this case, it's the, um, the gloves. And then for trays for corals propagations, basically this, this kind of tray. And then the big bucket uh, to store. And also, yeah, the big bucket like this. And then the big, another big bucket to store the final product. So I will go through it. Um, this is also the Ziploc bag. So this is very useful. And I use the same Ziploc bag uh, from the beginning of the project till now. So don't worry about wasting the plastic. Um, but um, when we extract the coral babies, the coral nubbins, the fragments, um, inside here has to be the same species because when you just like take uh, the fragments from different species and then you put it into same ziplock back here they also can uh, secrete the chemical uh, the slimes and everything because they identify them as an enemy it lower the it lowers the uh, survival rate as well so that's why like inside the back we have to carry the same species or uh, basically from the same colony if you if you uh, get a different species, then you have to uh, put it into the other ziplock bag. And so this is the coral source. Um, this is the criteria of the extraction. It is strictly prohibited to propagate from a healthy colony that attached to a substrate. So this is um, something that I really agree with this methodology. So a lot of people doing a coral propagation, they just like cut it from the healthy coral um colony i think it's not really i don't know like i i think it's not really um you don't really do the restoration because like what already exists in there if it's already stable why you break it why 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 don't uh why just you leave it and then you create a new one so not broke don't fix it yeah if it's not broken then don't fix it okay so that's why we have this the create criteria here so what we can extract, uh, the fragment extract will be from the breaking colony from human impact. So um, obviously in here, because of the diving and also uh, the circling and also probably the reef walking also can be from the boat activity. So there will be like a breaking colony. So something like this, we can take it. This, uh, this colony over here, this fragment over here, they don't have this, uh, it doesn't have the stable uh, substrates over here so we can extract this one and then we can propagate and then if for, for example like government or private um, they have a coastal development like harbor uh, wave breakers or something like that and there is uh, there are corals over there also is it, it it's acceptable for us to extract the healthy coral reef so we just relocate so this uh, methodology is acceptable if there is any uh, coastal development like this, and then we would like to relocate somewhere else. Um, so this is a very good opportunity if there is any, um, I don't know, like sometimes like government, they, they don't really do like a very good um, environment assessment. And then you can over this methodology, like moving the coral somewhere, it's acceptable for this one. And then if there is any coral disease occur, um so if the coal is like attached to the stable substrate but it's uh you see like disease also you can rescue them so you can take out the healthy colony and then you uh propagate somewhere else and then 
of course, if uh, the, the fourth one is the breaking colony from natural disasters. So from the wave and storms. So if we have like uh, a big waves or big storms coming and then like um, I remember like back in 2016, sorry, 17, like our uh, most famous uh, place to dive, Crystal Bay, it was a uh, very strong, there was a, a very strong waves or storm. Um, and we would like to, um, so like everything's like broken there. And then so we can find, we can find like a lot of this and then we can relocate and then we can propagate basically like rescuing again, it's susceptible. So that's the extraction criteria. And then this is the substrate that we use. So instead of the main main structure, uh, this is what we use the life rock. So um, it's available, it's, um, it's from nature and it exists like from a long time ago. Um, and the key of the life rocks, if it's, it doesn't have the life, but it has the life, like it's encrusted by um, like various kind of species. Like you can see the pink one in here is the crystal coral algae. You have also the encrusted little bit coral here. Um, this is the, um, the hamelda algae, something like that, sometimes sponges. So we're gonna use this one as our substrate. What's the reason? So uh, this is the benefit for, of using life rocks. So um, because life rock, they have the, the ability to stabilize the pH and also um, it's the source of the calcium for the baby corals to grow. Because when you attach the baby corals to this life rock, um, there is a direct contact to these corals and then um, so that's why the calcium transfer will be easier and it stabilizes like the, uh, the pH like sur in surrounding area. And life rocks also host uh, the nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. So it's important for the nitrogen cycle um, to prevent like uh, the algae bloom in the local area, like a local nursery. So uh, it's really important to have this one as well. This is really important when you have like, um, I don't recommend this, like a marine tank. Um, so live rock is also popular um, in this um, marine aquarium. And then the next one is playing a complex chemical role. So when it's overgrown by multiple organisms such as crystals, foreign algae, acidian sponges. So like these, creatures over here, they also uh, secrete um, a chemical, a like chemical compound. And this like complex chemical role, it will prevent like the unwanted algae to overgrow the corals. So that's why this is like a, a free cleaning surface for us. Because when we, uh, usually when we do like a coral propagation project and then we are really busy to clean, to brush, um, the structures with um, with brush and then it basically like um, wastes more energy where we don't use the natural one. But it's not solely because of this uh, life rock, but it um, give you like help to uh, clean your, your corals from the unwanted algae. And then also like the last one providing shelter for the inhabitants, for, for example, the smaller creatures like mollusks and crustaceans to help cleaning the nursery from unwanted algae because they will eat the algae. Um, so they are the cleaning surface for us so we don't have to brush them again. Um, because when we have the algae like covering the corals that the, that's the point when the corals will die. Okay, so um, this is how we do it. Like we cut, for example, the uh, the coral baby, we call it nubbins here, like in the small size like this. Um, and then we put it into glue. Uh, we put the glue and then the, um, the catalyst. So it's, it will stick like this. Um, and this is the life rock that we use. And then after that, it has to be like wet all the time because um, so that's why we have to pour the water and then we have also to circulate the water. So we have to take always the water from the sea and then pour it again, pour it again. So it's um, like the condition is uh, similar with the, um, the previous place. 
So some of the smiley faces from all the guys, something like this. So it doesn't have to be like a branching coral, but also the foliose coral like this is possible to, uh, to be propagated. So something like this. So usually one live rock, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna stick about three or two, depends on the size of the live rock. So the idea is to stick, to, to put it like this, for example, like in this quite short distance. Remember about that uh, ability, of course, to the diffusion. So um, when, they, um, when they grow and then they will, uh, for example, uh, they will grow towards here and here they will create like diffusion colony. So that's why like it will be a stronger structure. And then usually the first thing that we want to see is the, ba the base calcification over here. So the cyanoacrylate blue, like within days, it will gone. It will be gone around here. And then uh, we want to see like the calcifications around here. That's the point that we know our coral will survive. Right, so, um, and then when you see this, these pictures and then probably you will ask like, why is so small? Why um, some of the people just like cut um, a very big portions of the, <clears throat> of the colony? And then why is so small? So it's a, basically it's a technique. You, you can always choose and then you do your research. What's the best way in your area? But uh, this is what I found and then also, um, Anwar from um, the founder of the Ocean Quest, uh, he suggests that microfragmentation promotes faster base calcifications and growth rate, and also for the survival rate. So basically, we just cut it like in, into the smaller pieces. And also, I found uh, a scientific paper that says the same, and also it promotes. Um, uh, where is it? Yeah, the last one, promotes more chance for colony fusions, which is beneficial to strengthen the coral structures. So when you have the smaller um, uh, colony, less polyps, basically you're gonna have less animal. Um, when you cut and then you take it out from the water and then also you, you touch it, the coral will be stressed. Um, and then they will need time, they will need energy to repair the damage. So when you have less polyp, it means, this is like probably the logic, the simple logic that we have. So when you have less polyp, it means that you will require less, you will, yeah, require less energy to repair the damage, and then there'll be more energy to grow. If you cut like bigger size, and then all this colony stress, so that's why like they need more energy to repair all like those colonies, and then that's why you have to um, you you have to get more energy, and then it will be slower to grow. Um, and also the the con the conditions in Nusa Penida in here uh, we have the challenge also about the current. So where we have the smaller nubbins, we have the smaller baby corals uh, are less affected to be toppled by the strong current. So when we have a smaller size. Um, Basically, when the current comes, like the strong current, um, like the longest one will be like more susceptible to the current. Okay, so that's microfragmentation. It's really um, unique technique. Um, yeah, and then this is like another ex example from a research um, using the fusion, like the ability of fusions for for the colonies, so to strengthen the structures. So that's why they use the microfragmentations, like they just cut it like very small pieces, and then they grow in, 100, in 90 days like this, and this in 139 days, the same. And then you can see like, this is these two like, like different colonies, and then at the end, they have the fusion here. And then the structure will, like this will be, will be stronger. Because also in Nusa Penida, the challenge is the, uh, the current. We would like to have like stronger bonding like this, like the, a stronger structure like this. And then uh, how about the growth rate? So we want to see from this into this, like how long uh, are we going to take it? Um, so this is just a summary that I get from, I get from uh, the journal. This is from, from Australia Great Bay Reef. Uh, some of the, hang on, 
we have people joining again. Go on. Yeah. Don't worry about the numbers, but just want to show you. Um, so this is from Australia. This is the calcification rate, centimeters per year, um, with different species in a different kind of reef. Um, and also this one in Caribbean. So this is the summary from the Caribbean literature. And then I will say, I will give you the summary that the average of branching corals have seven until seven, sorry, seven to 10 centimeters per year. And for the massive coral is one until five centimeters per year, even less. Um, this is really, um, so the branching one, they are faster to grow, but also they are really easy to break, to break down, to be broken. Um, well, the massive one, it's, um, they have like, because they are just like a boulder, so they have a slower rate, growth rate, but they are more stronger. So that's why, so this is like our nursery that looks like this. It looks dull. It looks like, where is the, where's the coral? Like, you can't really see it because it's just uh, probably a month, a month old like this. So you can't really see. I have to zoom that in. So it looks like this. Um, that's why like, um, I have to lower your expectation to be like a beautiful garden at the beginning because um, to grow the corals, it will, it consumes like a lot of time, even years. So I will um, elaborate you, like I'm gonna show you like the pictures of our nursery first here. This is in the village property. So it looks like this from the top. So we, uh, we have like, so this, the, the substrate is a bigger coral rubbles. And then you can see like, this is a little bit like scattered around. This is our life, life rock over here. And then if you see like closer, there will be like small coral nubbins. This is our second nursery. So smaller rubbles looks like this and then you can see also like the left rocks over here like here here and the last one to our third nursery in Santal looks like this this is actually the planting from today so we have about 21 left rocks and about if I'm not mistaken about 59 coral nubbins so this is on top. It looks like this. Not really beautiful, but not because yet. not yet, because conservation takes time. If you want, it's not like making instant noodle, uh -huh. right? So you have to pop me. So you have to be really, uh, what do you say? Um, patient. patient, patient. Yeah. Right. So we continue to. Okay, this one. So if we zoom that in here, this is like three months old, uh, sorry, three, three weeks old. Yeah, three weeks old. So this is like the, um, the cross that we cut. And then you can see already like the actual polyp growing over here. And then they are under stress condition, of course, because we take it out from the water and then uh, we touch it all the time. But with the, of course, with the glove. But this is gonna be the process for them to grow. And then they already, they um, give the sign of growing already and this is really healthy. So if we zoom that in, it looks like this. You can also see the base as well, but there's no more, like the glue is totally. Yeah, so when you see, uh, when you see the first pictures, uh, it's a lot of cyanoacrylate glue and now it's gone already over here. So we have to wait uh, for this base calcification to happen. So when this happened, then we are sure that this one will grow. This is the other one. The other one's like this. And looks like this. So it's really small, like less than one centimeters here. But it's healthy and then it's growing. So you can see like this is like one animal, one animal, one animal. It's really small, like here also one, one. Here, one, 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 one. And this is the axial polyp over here. This is the younger, this is not bleach. This is like a younger uh, tissue. So that's why it's still white like this. So there, there is a sign of growing.
Okay. Right. So this is what we expect. This is not our feature, but this is what we expect to be our garden. Uh, it's going to be looks like, like this. So you can see like here, this is like a very healthy, um, successful um, a crop propagation. So they have like a very solid like substrate. Some, someone is not on mute. Okay, we're gonna mute all for a while. Yeah, so this is what we expect, but this takes probably years. So uh, I would like to monitor always and then take a picture and then to see like what's, um, uh, what's the progress. And then uh, I'm really happy to uh, give the pictures to you, give the update as well. So yeah, hopefully in the favor, of, um, in the good conditions of the water, especially because like we take also uh, advantage from the absence of tourists. So that's why the water quality is really good right now. Um, usually we're gonna have like hundreds probably boats around, um, but it's empty right now. So that's why the water quality is so good for corals to grow, to thrive. Yeah. And this is our monitoring program. So of course, um, uh, this is going to be a good program. So we don't only put it, we don't only like uh, put the coral babies and then let it grow. No, but we also would like to monitor the program, uh, monitor the, um, the growth of the, our babies. So every week we have to take the data for a survival rate. So we, we would like to see like how many corals like survive. Um, it also can be like not a mortality, but it also can be from uh, from the current if the um, the coral's gone, something like that. So we have to count like one by one, like how many we have like from this week into the next week. Um, and uh, we also have a coral bleaching report for every week. So as you know, probably we um, also probably this is a new information for for you. Uh, since November 2019, and OAA has declared um, to the tropical reefs that there will be, there will be like a coral bleaching event into, uh, in 2020. So we had it here, but uh, thanks to Corona, because there is no... Thanks to Corona. <laughs> thanks to Corona, because there is no divers around, and then the water quality is so good. So we have the coral bleaching, but uh, they, they are mostly survived. So that's why like we do this coral bleaching report and then from the early of June until today, we already see like the um, repairing from the corals naturally. And the data is reported to the Ministry of, the, uh, of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia. So they have, they open like a Google Drive that we can also submit the data towards them. Um, and then we do the Coral Watch every two weeks. So Coral Watch is based in Australia. Um, this is also to monitor um, any bleaching event. Um, so just to compare um, like the color races with the chart, by that we will know like um, this, the reef status, the health status of the corals. And also like every two weeks. So for example, like in the week one and three, we have coral watch and a week two and four, we have the water quality test. Um, when we want to grow the corals, we also need to know if the water quality is good for them to grow. Because when you try to propagate the corals in the bad water quality, then it, it probably um, gonna be difficult for you. So that's why we have to monitor the water quality all the time. Um, so this is, um, I think I have the pictures over here with the guys, yeah. So. Um, this is a very new topic for them. Um, like all the kids over here, all the kids over here, um, it's the, from the aquarium. So if you are an um, aquarist, you can always get this water quality test. And this is what we use for uh, monitoring the water quality, for example, and here the oxygen, this is the salinity. Um, of course, the oxygen is really important for, uh, for every species to, um, to survive. Um, this is the salinity because like if we have like rain or also like uh, the, wa the fresh water from the river, um, the corals like really fragile because they really want um, an exact uh, water quality. So it has to be salt salty enough, not too salty, but also not 
uh, fresh enough. So it has to be exact that saltiness. And then we also test like the NO3 and PO4. It's basically a substance uh, for the algae to grow. So when we have like an algae bloom, so uh, sometimes we have like a green water. And then at that uh, time, usually the NO3 and the PO4 value will, uh, will go up. And then we also have the pH test. Uh, we would like to see like to monitor the, um, the issues for ocean acidification. But for now in here, um, everything's um, all right for the water quality. So nothing to worry about. And it's really nice to, yeah. So the next one. So I also have to train them and they are really good right now to input the data. So to introduce to them as well, like what is the citizen science that they also, even they are like, they don't have the scientific background, but they also can contribute to science. So for example, in here, the, um, one of my guy just input um, the Coral Watch data to um, coralwatch.org. Um, um, this is straight, the data uh, will go to Australia. And also they do the maintenance all the time, just to see like, um, so if you see over here, like um, you can see like one, two, three, four. Um, so they will create like a notes, like a map, um, like home, how many live rocks do they have in their, their nursery? And then they need to count like how many, um, is it still here or it's, it's gone? So they have to create some kind of map. It's kind of like a dive master training as well that they, you have to create a map and then you have to locate where is the, um, yeah. There you go. So, so if you can see over here, yeah, there you, go. there you go. If you can see over here, this is like the, in every weeks they have to do like this. Um, so they have to like do the sketch, like how many corals do they have? And then where is the location? This is like pretty similar if you ever done um, a dive master training. So this is like your training basically. <laughs> so yeah something like this. So like, for example, like one, one rock, um, one life rock, you have like three coral babies, you have one or two, and then you need to be able to locate them. Um, because um, when they're, uh, when they're growing and they're stable, we see it like the base calcification. That's the point that we can measure the growth rate. Um, this is a very um, interesting also aspect to see um, if we want to do like a research on the coral growth because the coral growth in a different location will have a different value always. Okay, go to the next one. And also the last one, the last but not least is the social impact. Um, so um, this is a very nice um, from Hegarty 1997. So it's a very, very good um, topic about how a coastal management can be also, how to say, like a local community can be involved as well in the coastal management. So uh, he said, like, start with the what, uh, start with what the people know. So that's why, like, we need to uh, empower these people, like the local community, um, to know better why it's important to conserve the reef, why it's important to protect the reef why it's important to only take this kind of fish, for example, why, what is more in protected area, because um, the community-based approach is really important. When, um, let's put it simple like this, when I'm not local Nusa Penida, I'm not, even though I'm Indonesian, I'm not from here. So when they, when I try to say to them like, hey, you can't really take this fish out or you need to protect the reef, they're gonna say like, who are you? Like, um, what are you gonna do here? Because like, I'm here since my grand, grand, grandparents, for example, like that, you're just here, like we need to eat, something like that. But when we try to approach the local people and then we educate them, and then we try to, that's why we have to translate into their language. Um, that's how we also transfer the knowledge into their neighborings, they, uh, their communities. So that's the most effective way to do it. So it's slowly, but it's more effective rather than like one people saying like, you can't do this, you can't do that because it's not from there. It's more offensive as well. So 
yeah uh this is also like uh, like one of the effort to uh to empower to also to educate the local people like everybody basically not only local because um everybody's here basically um yeah to uh to know what's the importance to protect the coral reef and then the next target we also can conduct a social study to quantify the impact of the shared knowledge about the importance of protecting the coral reef so um because like they already know like what's the importance for that for them um to protect the reef and then they also can share to their friends when they just play you know they just play volleyball or they just like get around playing music and then they can just casually talk about the importance of the coral reef and then this is like um a very interesting subject to um to be researched um so yeah social people also can play the role in um in the successful of the coral restoration because the perspective of uh, the people here, the local community here, probably uh, could be different from us. And then also the next target, we will send uh, the message to the younger generation. So we will uh, outreach like uh, local kids around and then like to um, also to educate like what's the importance to protect the reef, to introduce to them like what's the reef and then probably to take out them to do like a snorkeling activity to see like um, what is coral reef and then also you can see all around the reefs you can see like fish around because it's their home their habitat something like that so taking also the message to the younger generations is the effective um, aspect to see um, to uh, the approach to protect the reef okay um, so this is also probably this is the last slide yeah this is just I just want to share this picture um, this has just happened um, this morning, actually. And this is like not the first time. So when we do the propagation, so we set up like a local, uh, no, sorry, uh, a wet lab like this, a very simple one. And then just the local people just stopping by and then like, they just like, what are you doing? And then this guy with their Balinese language, they will talk to this lady and then try to explain what, what they do and then what's the good um, for the coral reefs. Um, this is not the first time because like people always like get, uh, get interested like what we are doing here. So I think this is a very great impact for the local community as well. And at the end, these guys over here, they also get paid from um, the generous donations near and far. Um, so they, uh, we also support their livelihood. Um, during this uh, very hard time until the tourism comes again. Okay, I think this is the last slide. Uh, right, yeah. okay, so the take home messages, I would like to show you the video that we create for the update, if it's possible. Yeah, we try. We're gonna try. Hang okay. on a second. So, before we start, yeah, just ask them. Can everybody see the video right now? It's just coming in on a different screen. If you could type in a yes or no, that would be great. You can see the VLC, or can you just see the PowerPoint? No, not yet. Okay, give me two seconds to figure that out. Here we go. How about now? Share. How's that working? Sharing is paused. Why is sharing paused? Oh, yes? Yes. Oh, oh great. great. Oh, it's working. <laughs> OK. OK, so enjoy the video. It's just a short four minute video. Uh, we are releasing it tomorrow, so you guys are the first ones to see it. Yeah. And a very special thanks to all the people who helped put this video together. We're pretty excited about it. Okay, enjoy. Maybe. Hi, my name is Pascal Sebastian, and I'm the lead marine biologist of the Indo Ocean Project. 
Coralia says that initially they started in Lusopnida as a social ecological response to the effect of COVID-19 policy on tourism dependent islands. After only a few weeks, we are able to reach our fundraising target. And thanks to the generous support near and far, we are creating jobs, educating tourism, industry workers, and protecting our oceans. Coral reefs cover less than 0.1% of our Earth's surface but are the most biodiverse marine ecosystem in the world. They are also among the most threatened. Climate change, destructive physical practices, pollution, and other stressors caused by human activity is driving rapid declines in coral reef health. Indonesia is part of the Coral Triangle, our planet's marine biodiversity hotspot with over 6,000 fish species and 76% of the world's coral species. Ocean-loving travels flock to Indonesia, making it one of the world's most desirable diving and snorkeling destinations. Nusa Penida is in the top of the list due to its accessibility, vibrant coral reefs, and our rare megafauna sightings. Destructive fishing practices and natural disasters combined with an increase in tourism on the past. Is it playing for anyone else? Is anyone else getting the video? Or do we just stop? You can hear the audio only. Can't see, no. Okay. Why did I fix that? Sorry, guys. Okay, one second. I'm gonna rewind it. Let's try again, shall we? Try again. Just type to the chat if you have any problem, if you can see the video. Hi, my name is Pascal Sebastian, and I'm the lead marine biologist of Indo Ocean Project. Coral Lions is an initiative started in Lusa Penida as a social ecological response to the effect of COVID-19 policy on tourism dependent islands. After only two weeks, we are able to reach our fundraising target and thanks to the generous support near and far, we are creating jobs, educating tourism, industry workers, and protecting our oceans. Coral reefs cover less than 0.1% of our Earth's surface, but are the most biodiverse marine ecosystem in the world. They are also among the most threatened. Climate change, destructive physical practices, pollution, and other stressors caused by human activity is driving rapid declines in coral reef health. Indonesia is part of the Coral Triangle, our planet's marine biodiversity hotspot with over 6,000 fish species and 76% of the world's coral species. Ocean-loving travels flock to Indonesia, making it one of the world's most desirable diving and snorkeling destinations. Nusa Penida is in the top of the list due to its accessibility, vibrant coral reefs, and our rare megafauna sightings. Destructive fishing practices and natural disasters, combined with an increase in tourism over the past decade, has damaged sections of the reef. This has stirred large areas of a one percent reef in the Mara, which decreased shelter and niche habitats for reef creatures, resulting in a loss of biodiversity and biomass. It also creates an unstable substrate which is undesirable for the reef building course to grow, and the recovery is slow and difficult. Partnering with Ocean Quest Global, our core propagation program focuses on rehabilitating these damaged areas of a reef, using an all-natural, non-invasive coral propagation methodology that has been tested across Southeast Asia since 2016. Our team of coral rangers have been hired to install, monitor, and grow three coral nurseries along the northern coast of Nusa Penida. These individuals are employed tourist industry workers with no previous scientific experience. In the first two weeks, they have all been trained in coral ecology, taxonomy, propagation, and ecological monitoring. Under my supervision, the team sets up a portable land-based wet lab and collect live frogs, and detach coral fragments from around the nursery sites. The fragments are cut into small coral nubbins and attached to the live rock using cyanoacrylate and an ocean-fast pattern catalyst. 
The live rock is transferred from the wet lab to the nursery site and secured to the sea floor in the optimal growth conditions. With the right care and attention, these small corals will grow into strong foundations to recover damaged areas and reach the healthy reefs. In two weeks, we have deployed several coral rangers, installed three coral nurseries, and planted 97 corals. We will be growing and monitoring our coral nurseries over the next six months, and we invite you to follow along. This program is funded by the generous donations of our supporters with wine, and thanks to them, we have reached our first goal. But with further donations, we will be able to expand and install more nursery sites and employ and training more local workers. Check out our website for more information on how you can get involved. Thank you. list of everyone who was supporting us over the last few months. Um, this one is great. So, this will be this. Um, I guess now we can, uh, with whoever's left on, we still got 19 of you, um, we can chat a little bit about yep, discussion. Sure. Um, if anybody wants to ask questions, probably, or discuss, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the big part about this project as well, that uh, I mean, of course, the science and the helping our oceans, but a big part was the social um, and the outreach that we're able to do. So the way it's structured is um, we kind of have two tiers of, of workers. Um, the Top tier is more um, diver qualified, so dive instructors, dive professionals. Um, and this is where we branched out of Panita itself and hired people from Flores and from East Java. Uh, but then we have our second level, which is like our research assistants. And those uh, are employed specifically from the Banjars, uh, from the villages that we are planting the coral in. So uh, to, to get our knowledge back into the village that we are that we're working in yeah that's day. something that I, yeah that's something that i didn't say before yeah so Just yeah so. we have to find like not really have to but it's really good to have uh the guy from that village that i can transfer so um for example like we have these three nurseries the first nursery is named prapat so these two guys which um oh, yeah, Arya and Barit so they have to monitor the corals like just in front of their house so that's so good um that's how we empower like um, um them to protect the reef from there yeah yeah so the noise goes back to them and then uh they can spread also the knowledge towards the neighbors over there it is around 90 percent of the funding that we were looking for uh which was a total of uh, 60 million in the end um 90% of that goes to the salaries over the next six months for these guys. Um, and then the other little bit to make sure we get the catalysts, we get the, the, the things that we need for them to yeah. actually do mm -hmm. the work. So it was, I mean, we got funded in two weeks. It was yeah. pretty exciting. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we, because like uh, for the tourists right now, it's really slow, uh, slowly open. So like people who, who decided to, to be stuck in Bali, <laughs> they can come here. Yeah, like the international yet. tourists and also like the, um, the domestic flight also open. And also people will, um, like the international flight will open at um, September 11. But it's really uncertain. So by these donations, we have secured um, the next project until December. So t thanks to everybody yeah. for support. Mm -hmm. Um, so we will uh, continue to monitor these corals, like the, the grow of the corals, and also probably we'll do more update for you when the corals like growing into more structure. So it's more feasible for you to see rather than like uh, uh, those stones sad over there. Looking. Sad looking stones <laughs> over they're, there. They're doing it. They're, they're doing, doing the it. Job. Yeah, but it's like really micro, like really tiny right now. Okay, so we got question from Anna. Yes, Anna. So at the moment, we do have enough uh, funding to do our uh, six coral rangers for six months. 
and then uh, what activities are predicted during that time. So yeah, as we were explaining before, they monitor and mm -hmm. grow the coral nurseries themselves. So today you guys were back out uh, yeah. planting. So basically like, uh, like it's not really when we planted it first, it's not really successful, like directly. It's like kind of trial and error and we have to like adapt with the conditions, like with the local conditions here. So that's why like we have to replant again. And the second one has been really successful and we would like to continue to grow again and grow again. But also we have to see like uh, our budget, but obviously like the more donations we have, we will grow more corals, like the nurseries. Hire more people. Hire more people and, as yeah. well, yeah. So the main, uh, I think, kind of thing there too, it, uh, da, 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 is the fact that like these guys can have full-time jobs. Um, oh yeah. Definitely. Like they're only really working, they only really work what, maybe once or twice a week once, for a few yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can still, if, if tourism comes back, they can still go back to their regular job and find time for this kind of as a side, yeah. as a side project. Yeah, for example, like, um, our, our guy, time. our guy Kadek, uh, in daily basis, he works for the constructions for his dive center, Purple Dive. But when I ask him to like come with me, and then he um, he will ask the boss to say like, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna have a schedule with with the coral guys. Can I can I go? Like they, they can go. So it's not like an exclusive work for them. This is like a really like a work to support them uh, for their livelihood. It's like a part time job for them." um yeah so yeah it's um, also like a combination um they're doing uh yes there's a salary involved but there's also education and certifications involved so they're doing the ocean quest certification course with yeah. pascal um so if they continue on in their ocean career some of them are musicians but you know some of them are are training to be dive guides that this knowledge and these certifications they'll be able to apply to their uh to their job as well so yeah. it's a combination. It's a very great additional for their CV. And also I'm really happy to uh, introduce them to a conservation job because like probably they never thought about this before. Like um, you yeah. can actually work uh, to conserve the nature. Um, so this is like the best way for me also to introduce what am I doing? Because like, um, it's really hard. It's really difficult for me to explain like what a marine biologist does here. So that's why um, through this one, I can really explain like, this is what I'm thinking about. This is the vision. And um, this is why we, we would like we to protect the, the reef. Yeah, we would like the program. <laughs> we really like the program. Uh, it also keeps us sane in Corona time. So we have a question here. Are there more uh, than one ways to plant or attach corals? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, there'd be a lot. You also like the easiest way, um, honestly, you can just use a zip ties, you know, the zip tie? Yeah. Yeah, a zip ties. So you just like cut the corals and then you just use the zip ties and then, um, yeah. It grows over like, the coral. That's it will a grow very over common the, one. Yeah, that's a very common one. But, but you use plastic, plastic in, the ocean. in the ocean. But it's also okay, like yeah. if you can manage that. I mean, um, in the sum of, we, because we can't really justify like this, the, your location is the same like ours. Um, so for us, so we'll, we love to have like um, the organic way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reason we chose, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And we're actually going in for another propagation, uh, like five day workshop course in yeah. next week mm -hmm. um, with Ocean Gardener using totally different, uh, totally different methodology technique, yeah. and technique. Mm -hmm. So, which is going to be installed on Nusa Panita as well in Crystal Bay. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, especially in Panita. I think right now there are five different coral propagation or coral restoration programs in place within Nusa Panita alone. So um, different organizations trying to do this and that, and some of them really successful, some of them a little less successful, yeah. but it, it is a trial and error. Um, what works in Koh Tao in Thailand doesn't necessarily work here. And we kind of have to figure that out. Yeah. We, we read and, and do as much research as we can, but yeah. in the end, we just have to figure it out by doing yeah. it. So it's, it's, it's really a field work. So you have to really adapt with the conditions and yeah, it's a trial and error. Uh, Questions from, from Lauren. Lauren. Hi, Hi Lauren. Lauren. <laughs> uh, one of our old interns. What do you use to secure the live rock 
to the substrate. Yes. Yeah. So um, basically, we don't have to use anything. Uh, we also can integrate it into. So what we're gonna do? We're just gonna how to say it like this? I don't know. Wiggle, Shimmy, wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle it. In. Yeah. So <laughs> you're gonna wiggle. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. wiggle. <laughs> So we get, you're gonna wiggle that into the core rubbles, and then you also will have like a uh, little bit amount of rubble. So you just uh, swipe it like this, as natural as possible. As natural as possible, because they're so uh, like number one, the coral nubbins are so small. Number two, the live rock themselves are are not too large. There's not a lot of rolling action happening with the currents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's the typical Ocean Quest way. I mean. The, 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 rebar. the rebar oh yeah so we also can modify with like a rebar that you do like l structure like this and then this is the life rock and then you just like uh, hammer it like this so it will secure the life rock um in the but high the, current yeah areas. in the high current area but also um if you it's still movable so if you want to like detach the rebar you still can do it uh, basically just to make sure the rock is there because um, if we do like the effort to do the propagations and it's gone because of the cars or the waves and um, it's gonna be a waste of time. Let's turn that thing off. Another question. Uh, yeah, oh, I just saw that. Yes, I did. <laughs> Stop my screen sharing. I forgot about that. What's that? Uh, oh, because it was the oh, you want picture to, yeah. from before. Yeah. Um, if you find a bigger piece of coral broken, would you still try and attach or just only try and save the smaller ones? Okay, so this is also the principle of um, this propagation methodology. So um, you want to stabilize the structure. So if like when we search for the coral, for, for the fragments, and then you will see like a bigger piece of cor uh, broken corals. And then if you see like a hole or a crevice over there, and then you can just uh, take it and put it over there and then you can just secure it. Um, that's already um, a restorations basically. So you, you don't have to, you know, you find a corals and then you want to cut it. It doesn't have to be like that all the time, but you also can take like a bigger chunk if you see, and then you just secure it somewhere. So back again to stabilize the, um, the substrate. Yeah. So it doesn't really move because of the uh, waves or the current or also the silts or the sedi sedimentation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like he, he does a lot more of the coral stuff than I do, but I feel like the big ones for the project that we're using aren't really um, as useful as we're trying to secure the substrate. So having more little ones covering more surface area securing more substrate is more beneficial for us to kind of create that um, that foundation of the reef that in future more corals yeah. and larger corals can mm -hmm. be supported on. But in the end of the live rocks that we're using, these smaller ones, they, they just can't really support the bigger coral yet. But corals build their own foundation, yeah. so they'll build it themselves. Yeah, so that, that's why I said to you, like, the most important thing is the base calcification when they have it, and then they will um, spread, yeah. they will encrust um, into the base. That's how they stable, sta stabilize the substrate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions or discussions, maybe? Yeah. If people want to unmute, you can talk to if you have other questions. If not. Good, good. <laughs> okay. All right. I have a question. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Video, so I can actually see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Boise. <laughs> I'm not in Boise, but I am from Boise. Um, my question is like, what do you see the future of the project? Do you anticipate trying to continue it in some way, even after the shutdowns are over or not? Absolutely. Like, I mean, the next six months are going to be critical for us to grow the coral and to track it, track it. At that point, it can kind of, we hope, like with minimal monitoring, um, be able to continue, but we will also have our full force of our interns uh, back as well. The guys, we hope to still continue that, but uh, that's something that might be passed on to some of the future interns coming. Yeah. 
because like also based on the, on the principle we use the nature to uh, maintain it so we don't have to clean it all the time because also the other issue in the other locations uh, when you try to propagate the corals and then you have to deal with all the algae, like the turf algae or something like that and then you have to scrub all the time and then with this left row hopefully um, with that chemical compound so um, it's just like a cleaning agent so we don't have to do like a lot of maintaining but we love to take out our interns or everybody just to see yeah. um, create the result. community mm -hmm. events around it where like we can yeah, even even you know the those babu babu people as well. <laughs> if you remember, <laughs> they can come as well. Yes, we're see. gonna be having the recording. Um, it is still recording. We're going to be uh, uploading this recording onto some of our social media as well as a downloadable version on our website pretty soon. There is a question. When you see the coral bleaching from the tip, would you cut it off at the tip? So the white. Talk about the difference between the growing and the yeah. Growing. So also, um, we we prefer to take one that really healthy. So the chance of the growing, it's um, the chance of the survival rate is high. So that's why, like, probably we wouldn't take the bleach one because they are already stressed. And then when we take out take them out to uh, to the land, it will create like more stress for them. So I prefer not to touch it um, for the bleach one. Um, but we we also can cut like the like the bleach part and then we can take like the healthy part as well because they even though they are like a different individuals like per polyp but they are connected into one same structure so um, I would prefer to take like the healthy one like the fragmented um, on the ground but still healthy yeah just to make sure we're clear like we don't ever damage the coral that it is healthy we take they head out. They head out to the shoreline, snorkeling, and they find the free floating fragments that are already uh, going. So these would be lost anyways, and fairly soon would probably roll into the depths and no longer be yeah. able to produce photosynthesis mm -hmm. and probably die anyways. So that yeah. that's the to increase the chance of yeah. the survival for them. Yeah. yeah, to give a second chance. So we're never actually going in there and breaking the coral off of an existing structure. It's already free floating in the, in the current or in the yeah. way, like usually within the first few meters. Um, yeah. So would cutting of the tip help the coral survive? Uh, not really. It doesn't have it, to do with that. It, it, um, it's not a disease, it's like a contagious yeah, disease. It's not disease, but it's also it's about the water quality. Um, can be the temperature, can be because of the pollution, yes, um, yeah, acidification as well. So when you propagate in um, that time as well, it's probably your chance to grow the coral is low, very low. So you also have to make sure your water quality is good as well. What about other diseases for that? Like the, like the band diseases, mm -hmm. is that something that you could cut out of? Is that more yeah. of like a yeah. infection? So you, yeah, it's like right. an infection. Okay. So um, you can just take out like the healthy one and then you still have a chance to, to grow the healthy one. Yeah, there's lots of different kinds of uh, diseases, but like a very common, well, yeah. one of the most common ones is like this band disease, a few different colors of this band disease. Um, and that is more of like an infection that's happening that if you cut out the infection then the rest of the coral will be okay will be strong yeah. but bleaching is we don't it, i mean we know it's but. complex it's really <laughs> complex but yeah. mostly it's because of the water yeah like the mostly temperature the temperature yeah, yeah. That's the temperature what most, most papers are pushing towards yes yeah. the... because uh, yeah uh the climate change issue and also the ocean acidification issue um it's basically like you just cut like um, the section, the healthy sections, and then you put it into the same exact same water again. Uh, that's gonna be the same. Um, I mean, like the stress is high, so your survival rate of growing corals, your baby corals, will be will be very low. Something like that. Great question. Yeah. Thank uh, you for that question. Yeah. Okay. That's it so far. Mm -hmm. Last chance, anyone? Okay, so thank you so much for uh, joining us on our second webinar series. Our first one was last week on equipment specialty. Mm -hmm. uh, Pascal's going to be doing this one all over again in Bahasa.
pretty soon. So um, so for the Indonesian audience, probably if you want to uh, meet the team, so I will uh, invite all the teams to. We'll have all the coral rangers. Yeah, all I will one. invite. Yeah, I try to invite them like in one time, and then we try to discuss. And probably this will be more. Um, in a social way, yeah, in a social way. Yeah, it'll be a bit, um, <laughs> they're pretty funny. So. Yeah, they're pretty funny <laughs> and yeah, I mean, um, also to see like the social impact they have uh, given to their neighbors, yeah. Yeah, their friends as well. Um, like and we'll be able to do some translation too with that. So if, if uh, non-Bahasa sure. Indonesian speakers out there, but I'm sure Lauren will be willing to translate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Laurie Christensen, not you this should Lauren, translate. Not Lauren. <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you very much everyone and then we'll be doing webinar series all month uh, with different guests talking about different subjects. Uh, we're trying to do it every Saturday uh, at this time and I think that's it. Yep, thank you for your support, thank you for uh, listening, makasi banyak um, for watching us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and keep sharing yeah, and keep sharing. all that stuff with, with the project. Perfect, thank you very much guys. And uh, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Good night from Lusa Panida. Good night.